Good evening. Welcome to all of you who have joined us in person, hello, via Facebook, live, and on Zoom. For those of you who are here in person, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you. Sure hope I did mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We begin our Wednesday evening service with a pre-service meditation. So I invite you to get still, close your eyes. I like to put my feet on the ground so to ground myself, and I like to put my back against the back of the chair and sit up straight. As we play God's the Love That I Am chant, you can choose to chant along with it or simply follow along silently, repeating this mantra, God is the love that I am. When your mind wanders, just notice it and go back to the mantra, God is the love that I am. And I'll bring you out in 10 minutes. Enjoy.
So our meditation is coming to a close. So please bring back your awareness to your bodies and your surroundings. You want to wiggle your fingers and toes and join me in the service. Welcome to those of you who have joined us while our meditation was in progress. We're so glad to have you here virtually or in person. Let's begin with our opening chant, God is in this place. God is in this place. Yay! Thank God. Thank you, God, for being here. <laughs> anyway, please join me in prayer. Oh, boy, God, thank you. As I recognize the one power, the one present, one principle, the one, the only God, who is all present everywhere, all knowing and all powerful, and who is love. And I, the good news is, is I am one with this power. I am one with God. I am an emanation of the divine. There is nothing that can separate me from my creator. I know this for myself, and I know this for each and every one on, of you. Whether you're on Zoom, on Facebook, in the sanctuary, or anywhere else, I absolutely know that we are all a part of the great mind of God. And I speak my word this wonderful evening, this chilly evening, knowing that God is directing this service and God is leading and we are blessed by this knowledge. We are blessed that Reverend Sidney is channeling God's truth, God's word tonight. And she is doing it with love and laughter and kindness and we learn exactly what we need to learn. We hear exactly what we need to to learn and hear, and it is all done with love. And I am so grateful that we are so blessed with our team that puts on this service, the, the music staff, the volunteers, the staff of our church. We are so blessed to have everybody here putting on this beautiful service. And with a grateful heart, knowing that God is here, I release my word into the law of mind knowing that God says yes to us all. And so it is, and together we say, Amen. Thank you, God. Now please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily strength as we forgive those who forgive <laughs> but deliver us I've, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I only say this every day, but who knows what happened. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Catherine. You hurt me, we hurt and 
until we're through. We think we're over it, but it shows in the things we do. It eats us up inside till there's a hole a mile wide filled with anger and fear. And now I know when I forgive for good, that's when I am free to release the pain of the past. It's for me. It's for you, it's forever we are blessed. When we find forgiveness. I judge you and you judge me. We judge our lives away. And we think we're just a and it shows in the things we say. It eats us up inside till there's a hole a mile wide filled with sorrow and fear. So now I know when I forgive for good. That's when I of the past it's for me it's for you it's forever we are blessed when we find forgiveness I held you responsible I could have held you tight but I had to be right just had to be right and now I know when I forgive for good that's when I am free to release the pain of the past it's for me it's for you it's forever we are blessed when we find forgiveness. We find forgiveness when we find. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm thinking that you just pretty much did literally do my whole talk just now. All righty then. Hi. How is everybody? I am glad you're here. So um, I'm going to start with a story. There's a story about Martin Luther King where he was approached by a man, a white man, and the white man saw him and said, are you Martin Luther King? And he said, yes, yes I am. And the man spit on him. And Martin Luther King pulled a handkerchief out from his pocket and he wiped this, I'm, it's a wonder way, there's a song about this that is so beautiful and the lyric says, wiped the hate from his suit. And he did, and he handed the handkerchief to the man and said, I believe this belongs to you. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. could have told himself a story that was, I am absolutely in the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and 
clearly I must be a target for somebody else's hate. Or he could have told himself a story of, I need to get out of this whole peace business. He could have told himself a million stories. The man had his own stories too. He had his stories about who knows, but his story informed him and oriented him into a place where he needed to express his hate to a man, another human, by spitting on him. Dr. King changed the narrative. He switched the story and looked at where the real truth of the story was, who was the author of that story and, and who owned that story. So this talk tonight is about radical forgiveness. So I hope that uh, I am able to do my job as a minister, which is to, let's see, comfort the afflicted or to afflict the comfortable. And if you're comfortable, then you'll probably be irritated by the end of the night. Um, I need you to know that there is something radically right about you. There is something radically whole about you. There is something radically good, wonderful, perfect, and awesome and magnificent about you. You and I have pressed into this time and space with all of the amazing, unique spiritual DNA and beauty of God itself. So I want you to take a moment to consider yourself, consider this story about yourself that you are a creation of the highest order and magnificence. If this is not a story that you are used to telling yourself, then I just want you to step aside from whatever stories you have told and imagine this one is the story. That everything else that has happened before this point, those stories are over. This is the story that you want to tell yourself now. In this infinite field of possibility, which we call God, you have already been given full access and license to all that this universe holds and all that it is and all that it means because you are part of God. You are a part of God. You are a part of and you participate in, you draw from that same mind, that same limitless intelligence which creates and sustains galaxies keeps the planet on which we walk rotating. And by the way, the mind designed humans to be able to eat, sleep, walk, dance, and love without either any of us having to instruct our, instruct our bodies, our nervous or circulatory systems on how to do their jobs. I wouldn't be able to do that, not in shop for shoes at the same time. It would not work. So you and I are not random manifestations of some hinky or dysfunctional deity. We are containers for spirit. In fact, one of my students a while back, um, a voice student that I had when I was still living in Oregon, um, and by the way, great sweater. Thank you, Doreen. She kept me warm. I was so happy. Um, we were talking about God one time, and he said, you know, the way I, I view God and the way we are creations of God, and this was, we, we had not done many spiritual discussions, but he said, you know, it's like I view myself as perhaps a glass made of, a container made of ice. And then water is poured into that, and it all melts together, and that's God, and that's who I am. And I thought, oh my God, that is such a great analogy, and it's perfect. So we are containers for spirit. We are these beautiful containers for spirit. So here's another story. If we imagine ourselves as computers, the hard drive that we came into this world with is already preloaded and pre-coded for genius preloaded and pre-coded for genius. It is stable, fully beta tested, and automatically updates itself to the latest operating system because our server is God. Now having said that, why is everybody else so messed up? Why is the world dealing with so many huge and scary issues right now? What is that about? In fact, for that matter, why do you and I so often feel like we might be paying some sort of penance or debt for a crime we didn't know we committed and we, we've never been charged with? Um, 
if we really are divine technology of the highest order, why are there glitches and viruses and problems? Why, it, why does one country invade another? Because you and I and everybody else apparently keep downloading malware in the form of fear, resentment, greed, and ego. So not only does your hard drive appear to have problems, apparently your software is out of date and obsolete. I know some of mine is a little old. But anyway, in life, just as with computers, when we are working with false information, the results and manifestations can be really destructive. Right, the false, the stories we tell ourselves, the malware that we accept, somebody else's story about us, our old stories about us, perhaps a parent or a teacher or a conclusion or because of something that might have happened to us or something that somebody did to us. That's malware, that's a virus. And so that is, it's absolutely going to affect the way we are able to access that hard drive. It's gonna affect the way that it, it will appear to affect the way that that hard drive performs for us. Our world, it would seem, is manifesting experiences based on a massive scale of false information, malware, or what we call in New Thought, error thinking. So Ernest Holmes, who founded this teaching, said that the only problem we have is the problem of believing we are separate from God. That's the only problem. When we think we're separate from God, our whole construct of self-worth personal value, and even lovability. All of those ideas, those constructs become damaged or unworkable. They get broken. He said it this way, if we think of ourselves as being separated from the universe, we shall be limited by this thought, for it is a belief in separation from God which binds and limits. We are bound by nothing except belief. We are bound by nothing except our stories about who we are or who we aren't. He also gave us this idea. Man is a thinking center in mind, capital M, mind. Nothing is going to happen to him, and don't get hung up on the gender on this. He wrote this in 1927. Nothing is going to happen to him that does not happen through him, whether it be the result of his own erroneous conclusion, conclusions, those of his grandfather, or of those of the race to which he belongs. This is not in any sense fatalistic, for we may change the trend of causation, which has been set in motion at any time we decide to do so. It is the absolute with which we are dealing and nothing less. So this is what is fascinating, because we... We, we long to trust that there's a greater idea, that there's a greater presence and a power that is expressing through us in this, this high and glorious divine idea. And yet at the same time, we forget that this is absolute, that this is God. This is God. It's not big dummy in the sky. This is infinite intelligence that knows exactly how to harmonize and align everything in life. Everything. Because that is the nature of love. Love balances, love heals, love harmonizes, and God is love. Now step away from a construct that you might have of God with a personality, knowing that each of us personalizes that God, that glorious organized design. We are each the way that it individuates, individualizes, and expresses, and it's unique for each one of us. So, Sydney, what does this have to do with radical forgiveness? Well, I know you thought I was going to talk about that, and, and you all were probably really ready to get super triggered by it, but I have to kind of lay the foundation. So the belief that we are separate from God, or whatever term you like for that infinite invisible, has great agreement in the world, the human world, humanville. We look around, we see that based on appearances, behaviors, social media and broadcast news, that the pro predominant worldview is not that God is all there is. The predominant worldview is that there isn't enough, right? The predominant worldview seems to be a great fear of not enough. Based on appearances, you think there isn't enough money, there isn't enough love, food, resources, or whatever you can think of, so be afraid, be very, very afraid. And when fear is that by which we orient ourselves, we stop aligning 
with that big T truth of what God is, that God is all there is, everywhere equally present, that love, that infinite, infinite magnificence itself, that whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is not even a, it doesn't exist, but is centered within each and every one of us. We orient ourselves according to fear. We think that God is not all. We think God can be limited. And we orient ourselves according to getting and to resentment and judging and excluding anyone that might potentially want to take what clearly is ours. I know no one here. But the thing is, when fear is the compass, ego becomes the North Star. When fear is the compass that we are using, the ego becomes that which we magnetize toward. So now in the Course of Miracles, we read, the ego is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. That's, that just knocked me over. That, that phrase just really got me, that the ego is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. So... How are you and I orienting our lives? Is it according to that fear that is so predominant in the world? And are we responding from ego that we better get quick before it's gone? Because clearly there isn't enough and maybe you're more one with God than I am. So fine, you look like you've got all you need, but you probably have some of mine. I would wager that every war ever waged Every battle ever fought, every conflict that ever happened, happened because that fear of not enough became the galvanizing, rallying cry. Oh, and by the way, when we have not enough, then we're also usually pretty eager to assign an enemy, the other, and, and then we get to be afraid, and then we want to look for a hero who can save us from the end, and we get into this vicious cycle, this vicious, it's called the drama triangle, by the way, and it is all drama. All drama, because uh, uh, we have a victim, we have a perpetrator, and then we have a hero. And a victim requires a perpetrator, a perpetrator requires a victim, and they all need a hero. And so <laughs> that's how systems can be set up. But it's a false construct. It's not the truth of God. It's not the truth of who and what you and I are. So last week we talked about the human collective experience as the Adam you know, the guy in the garden, consciousness, and that the awakened life of joy, of wholeness and possibility, that's the Christ consciousness. Now, not Jesus, but the Christ, which means the anointed, the awakened, the light, or if you want to go with the Buddha consciousness, whatever works for you, but it is that center within us that is awake, that is so aware of its own connection, of its own divinity, that everything in life is oriented from that. From that, not to that, from, from that. The Adam thinking is collective. It's the metaphysical equivalent of being asleep to your own divinity, right? And you might remember that what we talked about was that we sleep in the collective. We sleep as the collective population, that human race mind, the human fear, the collective, and, and, and that ego, but we must awaken individually. We have to awaken individually. We have to do our work. We do the inner work of revealing and healing those beliefs, of exploring and interrogating those stories, the stories that told us there isn't enough, that we aren't enough. In other words, when we do that, we get to move out into the world finally as light. We get to move out into the world as light. You know, all of the limiting ideas that the ego would have us, would, would use to have us come out swinging and fighting are the ideas that if they are unrevealed and unhealed are going to be how we see ourselves, how we define ourselves how we limit our lives, or how we justify limiting our lives, or explaining, telling us ourselves the story of why our lives are limited, why our dreams have failed, why we have failed at our dreams. And it's also how we justify not having love or not feeling safe to love. It's how we justify the story of not 
celebrating or experiencing any semblance of hope or glory. There's a story we tell ourselves. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. And here's, because I know that was a lot of fun to hear that, but you want to hear something even more sucky? We blame everybody else for what has gone wrong in our lives. Because it really hurts to, to blame ourselves. And we have, many of us have not yet learned that there's a difference between owning and blaming. There's a completely different level to that. So we blame everybody else for what has gone wrong. And then we attach like glue to those judgments and the blame. And man, we, we are just like, like, an octopus that just will not let go. It's an insidious shift that happens at that point. We begin to define ourselves according to what someone else did to us or what we think they did to us. We define ourselves according to that experience. Whether those people did something or didn't or whether that actually happened, we define ourselves according to that story of the experience, that story of the pain, of the loss, of the attack, of whatever it was. We stop there in our knowing of who we are, and we say, yep, I suck. That's, that's where I am. And it might not, it's mostly not conscious. It's mostly not conscious, but it is that which becomes our navigation. Good times, right? Um, our perception of someone else's guilt and our dedication to keeping them responsible for our pain and suffering is exactly why we have pain and suffering. So, you know, I'm going to ask the question. You know I'm going to ask this. Anybody, and you don't have to hold up your hands. You can just, you know, on the inside. Anybody here holding someone else responsible for your pain and suffering or what happened? Anybody got that going on? How's that working for you? You know, the day I decided to stop identifying myself according to what had gone wrong in my life was the day I had a real awakening to my Christ beingness. And the day I decided to stop identifying myself according to whomever had hurt me, wronged me, or betrayed me. And I had a good list. I had a really good list, man. I was keeping track and, oh, oh. Yeah, really, look, he did that to her too. That was the day I stayed awake to my Christ beingness. Forgiveness literally and metaphysically means to give for, to give for. So think about that. To forgive does not simply mean to arrive at a place of indifference to those who do personal injury to us. It means far more than this. To forgive is to, yes, to give for, to give some actual definite good in return for the quote-unquote evil given. Now, that could be a big leap, but here's what I want to ask you. If there's an area in your life where you have something that has been blocked, that no matter what you've done, you can't seem to get past a block that has kept you from maybe love, abundance, um, career satisfaction, career success, health. I want you to just take a moment and look back at what might have been going on at the time you began to have the issue with whatever it is, whether it's your money, with your health. Just begin to look at what might have been going on. And is there someone who needs to be forgiven. See, when we don't forgive someone, when we don't give a new story, which is really all it is, when we don't give a release, which is love, for what happened, then we are still identifying with it, and it absolutely will affect other areas of our life it will absolutely affect other areas of our life. One of the iconic New Thought writers um, was a woman by the name of Emily Cady. She wrote a book titled Lessons in Truth. And in it, she wrote this, the very pain you suffer, the very failure to demonstrate over some matter that touches your own life deeply may rest upon just this spirit of unforgiveness that you harbor toward the world in general, Put it away with resolution. Put it away with resolution. 
look at what might be causing the block. It often won't be, ha it won't have anything to do with the issue or the, the subject area. It might not have anything to do with the actual money. But if there is someone in your life that you are holding, holding and defining yourself according to, yeah, look at that. And consider that a new story might serve you so much more. Consider that anything that you are holding about someone, and this is the hard part. If you're holding them to be the perpetrator, then conversely, you have a belief, whether overt or covert, that you're a victim. Now, are we willing to no longer tell ourselves that we are victims? Are we willing to no longer orient ourselves towards that mindset, that limiting idea? It takes time, it takes definition, it takes discipline. But it is so much better to live that way as not a victim, as someone who is free. You know, it's a Dolly Parton line, you know, get off the cross, somebody else needs the wood. We don't have time for this. You know, the, the reason we have all of these Bible stories, by the way, is not because we're, we look at them historically or literally, but that we want to gain some understanding about parts of our own lives. And the crucifixion is one of those stories. The crucifixion. Anybody ever feel crucified in your life? You feel like you have been attacked unjustly and that you were held up and in pain? That's the idea of crucifixion. And yet, it took time but there was a forgiveness, and then there was transcendence. And so what we see in a number of stories all through the Bible is crucifixion of one form or another, and then transcendence. Crucifixion, transcendence. But the middle ground of that is forgiveness, a new story, a new story, a new story. I liken it to being the judge in a case and realizing when people come before you in your courtroom and you realize that you already know something about them. And so rather than be out of integrity and try to run the case, you recuse yourself and step into the next room. And then, you know, let God take over. Just let God, let karma handle that one. You recuse yourself, you go to lunch because it's not your problem. Well, you and I don't have to keep track of somebody else's karma. Thank God. You know, part of, so the argument then, and, and I loved you mentioned this in your song about being right. And, you know, so you, we keep hearing the question, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And then the immediate response is, well, if I'm right, I'll be happy. No, you really won't. You won't for the mo your ego for a moment is going to go, yep, got it, think you did it. No, that's not happiness. <laughs> that is not happiness. Happiness comes from freedom. Happiness comes from no longer telling yourself a story that has bound you to an event or to a judgment. Every drop of giving some actual definite good, as Emily Cady said, in return for the perceived wrong or that thing that someone did to you is like another light that we lift, that we can shine in the world. And boy, do we need that right now. You know, so ask yourself, if you're willing to give up your list of who did what to you in order to leave this world, this precious, tender, and hurting world, a legacy of light and peace of mind. Because from this idea of oneness, the more you and I have light, the more someone over there gets light. The more we release, then they are released. When we can release, we are all released. Forgiveness makes room for miracles to happen. Love needs room to grow. Joy and peace need room to emerge. Are we willing to create the space that can only come from releasing our stories about who we are not? Forgiveness makes room for a new narrative of power and peace. Radical forgiveness makes room for a brand new life. So this week, I want to invite you to no longer define your life by what has gone wrong. No longer define your life by who has wronged you. That is not who you are. 
Instead, I want you to look to the higher truth of your being, that divine and perfect hard drive that you were preloaded and pre-coded with to be radically right, to be radically wonderful. There is something radically good about you. Do a hard reset. Do a hard reset on that hard drive. Go back to your divine factory settings, the ones that define you and, by the way, divine you. They divine you. You are a holy, sacred, radiant, magnificent, unlimited child of God. Tell that story. Tell that story. Let's pray. So we just turn within now. Oh, and we just surrender it all. Oh my gosh, we just let it go. In this field of infinite potentiality, of infinite good, infinite love, we choose now to know that that is the truth of life, that there is one power, one presence that doesn't just surround and fill all life, but it saturates it with itself, and that is God. It is good. God, the good omnipotent, that is who and what we are. Oh, and how good it feels to know that and to just relax into it and let all the other stuff go. We just let it go. It's really heavy to carry it. It takes a lot of work, and you have to remember it. So now we choose to remember with the divine remembering that we are one with God, one with each other, and that we have been preloaded and pre-coded with good, with love, with wholeness, with divinity. We are sacred love. We are the joy of life. We are God in form. And how wonderful to know that. For as we know it for ourselves, we know it for everyone else. And it is such a joy to behold. It is such a joy to behold that. So I know that where there appears to be separation from the truth of being preloaded and pre-coded for good and for wholeness and for love, that God is active there, that God is present there. For anyone in our families who might be living under the illusion, the dream state of not being enough, we know that they awaken now to that truth and they are Oh, inspired, enlivened, and empowered. They are raised up, and we raise them up. And where there appears to be a need for, for physical wholeness, we know God is there. We know God is present. We bless this church. We bless all churches everywhere, all shrines all synagogues, all temples, all ashrams, all mosques, all paths to God. And we particularly right now, we open our hearts and we let this love that we are, that we have be as a mantle around Ukraine and around Russia, that they might recognize and live by the new story, the true story, that there is only one that they are one in peace and that love is that which unites, blesses, heals, and absolutely reconciles. We know that that high, high truth, that is God, is the only truth there is. We let go of everything else and allow that light to be the one that we see. That is the one which shines and we hold that. We hold that, we know that. And we dare to be that. So I invite you to say with me, I know this, I, I can remember what to say, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And I invite you to also say, I choose to forgive so that I can move forward with my life. Say that now. I choose to forgive so that I can move forward with my life. How good it is to know that we have this, that we, are, that we are strengthened in this and held up. We are raised up and it is good. So for this and for so much more, I simply say thank you, God. I let it be so, and together we say amen.
Would you take your offering? Oh, she's reminded me. See, I took the sweater off and I put the mask on. All right. Would you take your offering, that idea of your offering, that would you give yourself, your love, your flow, your circulation, all of it. See it in your hand and hold it to your heart. And say with me, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. get that gig. I know you're going to get that. You're going to, you got that gig. I, I see you there now. I see it and I know it and I'm watching you and I'm going, I know her. And so it is. And so it is. All right. I want to welcome back for some fabulous, wonderful announcements. <laughs> the magnificent, the divine, the very spiritual and she knows how to dress in cold weather. This is Kale Palat, which clearly I don't. Thank you. Well, you look beautiful. <laughs> Hello again. Here are the announcements for Wednesday, February 23rd. That was a great message. Thank you. Oh, my God. It was great. For all the ways you can make donations to our church, go to nhcrs.org slash give. If you would like prayer with a practitioner and you are on Facebook Live, go on Zoom instead after the service and there will be practitioners waiting to pray with you. If you are in the sanctuary and would like prayer, come on up and we'll, we'll hook you up with a practitioner to pray with you. Thank you. Wednesday evening, Taze service on March 2nd, which is next Wednesday night. Meditation starts at 6.50 p.m. The service is at 7 p.m. Join us for Taze service. The evening will begin with a sound meditation followed by practitioner Joanne O'Brien facilitating an hour of sacred chanting, readings, and meditation. There will be a potluck on the patio following, so please bring your favorite dish to share. You won't want to miss this service. Grief support group on Zoom. 
This group, facilitated by practitioner Carol Winokur, meets this Sunday, I think it's the 27th, mm -hmm. at 1 p.m. on Zoom. Annual meeting, which you won't want to miss if you're a member of this church, this Sunday, February 27th, at 11.30 a.m., the annual meeting is for members of the North Hollywood Church and will be held in person and on Zoom. So if you want to go home after the service and get comfortable and um, go on Zoom, you could do it that way. The Zoom link is the same link that we use for our Sunday and Wednesday services and can be found on our website also, which is nhcrs.org. We look forward to seeing you there. We look no. forward, well. There's, okay. But wait, there's more. But did, but did it get in there? I don't know. Okay, well. Is it in there? I can make I, it. But, where but. is it? There it is. Okay, so, because Blair, Mr. President, told me I needed to. Oh, my twin. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, same exactly. Birth, same birthday. Yeah. Um, so, our annual meeting, if you're not a, meeting, not, not a member, we invite you to come anyway. We'd love for you to be there. If you are not sure of your membership status, please, please, please call the office. Don't try to, don't think that you're going to be able to do it on Sunday. I mean, if you're in person, we have a list, but if you're on Zoom, it'll, it won't happen. So please call the office. If you're on Zoom to do this, use your real name so that we can take attendance, because that's the only way we can do it. We have to have a quorum to have this meeting, and it's really important. And you know what, it's fast. Gosh, you all know how Dr. Mark will get us through this. It'll be about 32 minutes at best. Oh. Now here's what's really cool about this. If you come live, we're having a dessert luck afterwards. <laughs> You've heard of a potluck, and you know we do food here really, really well. You know, come to, you know, I always used to say, and I still do, North Hollywood Church, come for the service, you'll stay for the food. So we're doing a dessert luck. You can bring your, uh, your favorite pie, your favorite cake, a box of Oreo cookies, whatever you want to do, or just come and eat. That's what I'll probably do. But we would love to see you, and I think that's all I need to tell you. We just, we really need you to come, and you, we've got good news for this meeting. I mean, it's really, it's really good, so please come and um, help celebrate with us being part of this amazing community. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and if you're not a member, become a member. It's really lovely to be a member and be a voting member of this church. This is a wonderful place to be. Anyway, need I go on this? There will be a memorial service for Emer Emeritus Practitioner Dolores Cartolucci on Friday, March 11th at 2 p.m. in the sanctuary and on Zoom, and all are welcome. Let's honor her. Thank you for your consciousness. It is a, oh, thank you for your consciousness. It is official that you, that we will be returning to two services beginning Sunday, March 6th. Two services. Oh, thank you, thank you. Please remember that we will continue to Zoom and Facebook Live at our 945 service only. And our youth church will be open for the 945 service only also. So there's a 945 service and 1130 service. Please come. We are, we're spread out and it's real, it feels very safe, very safe. Okay, ready. Zoom virtual patio, which we have before and after Sunday and Wednesday services. If you're on Facebook, go to Zoom and ask <laughs> to be put in the patio and you can schmooze with other people. It's great. Okay, now we have a Zoom meditation beginning March 1st, our morning meditation that meets every morning, Monday through Saturday, is evolving from 15 minutes to 20 minutes of a meditation, thereby providing us with the opportunity to spend more time together communing in silence. The meditation will begin at 7.55 a.m. and will end at 8.15 a.m. We look forward to you joining us virtually for this special time of connection and communion. You don't want to miss this. Visit our nhcrs.org website to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events and to sign up for weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. All right. So let's pray out. It's cold out there. <laughs>
go home and I'll snuggle with my, my cat and my dog and my husband and, I don't know, maybe some artichoke. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> All right. Oh, what a wonderful world in which we live and that we know, we know that we know that we know that we know that we are here as the divine beings. And we speak this word of benediction. We speak this word of blessing, knowing that we are never praying to God, but that we are praying from God as that divine, as that love. And we go forth into this world knowing that we have been filled up with the, the sense of, of a new story. And we welcome that new story about ourselves and everyone around us. And we tell the story now of love, of peace, of forgiveness, of joy, of possibility, of humor, of light, of music, of all of it. So I am certain that as we live our lives, we live them mindfully, lovingly, and we are a blessing to the world. With so much gratitude, I know it is so. And together we say, amen. Thank you. Let's all sing Blessed Always one more time.